matched on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Tech. Here's Steve Dace. Greetings and welcome to a brand new season of Bigger 10. I'm Steve Dace alongside, as always, my co-host and never partner, the one and only Aaron McIntyre. Can you feel it? I know it is not quite summer, Aaron, but we are 80 days from kickoff to the 2023 college football season. Big 10 media days, the day that we are taping this here, seven weeks from today. The, the preseason magazines are out there on the store shelves now. It just seems like the right time to bring Bigger 10 back for another year. Indeed it is. I've picked up Lindy's and Athlon. Have not gotten a chance to read any of that yet. I picked that up on Sunday, but haven't had a chance to read any of that. So that's uh, probably going to be on the uh, weekend menu for me. 57 days. I know this is not the NFL uh, podcast. 57 days to the Hall of Fame game. Actually, the Canadian Football League, that kicks off this weekend. Because everybody, really? everybody cares about that. Wow. There is, by the way, college football historian on YouTube. And you'll thank me later. I, I know he's posting a bunch of old Michigan stuff right now, but there's a treasure trove of a lot of great college football classic games and specials and footage on there. I mean, it'll... It'll do more than tide you over through the off season. Again, you'll thank me I'm, later. I'm not trying to make you feel old, okay? And just as a matter of fact, I mean, Viva La Vida is 15 years old this year. A Rush of Blood to the Head, I think, was a 20 years old. No, 20, like, five years old uh, as of last year. Those are two Coldplay albums that I listened to growing up. So I'm feeling old as well. But uh, classic games to me, like, begin in 2002 or 2003. They've got the some 1980s. of those. They've got some of those. <laughs> See, I He's poked got... around, and I couldn't really find any off the top of the, uh, off, off the, top of the feed. You search classic college football games full on YouTube. You'll get a ton of stuff from every era. But, yeah, if you go and scroll through that guy, they're not, they're not really organized very well. You know, you got to go through the entire playlist. But if you do... There's plenty of stuff in there from the era that you're talking about, too. So it, it's a treasure trove. You'll enjoy it. All right. We've got a ton to get to here, man, on the season opening episode. A lot has actually gone on during what's supposed to be the slowest time of the year. Normally, we would have devoted like the entire episode to what we're going to lead off with in our first topic on our Big Five on Bigger Ten. But because of all the news, it's just one of the topics we will address and that is my annual college football coaching power ratings, all right? And why do I do these every year? Because, Aaron, they're a big part of how I settle ties in my college football preview that will be coming out about a month, a little more than a month from now. Remember, every year that's a, that's a forecast of how I think the season's going to go. And so what do I do with teams that I have power rated pretty closely when I'm projecting them out? Well, the team with the superior coach usually wins out. Now, how do I do – these college football coaching power ratings. How are they configured? Well, they're, they're put together with several different criteria. First of all, we look at the Power 5 head coaching overall resume. I rank this 1 to 10, and that assesses what each head coach has done strictly as a Power 5 head coach alone. Next, we look at your non-Power 5 head coaching overall resume, and this is where we assess what each head coach has done as either a group of five head coach, a power five top assistant coach, an NFL head coach or assistant coach on a scale of one to five. We factor that in too. The current coaching trajectory, we assess whether the needle for the next four years or a full recruiting cycle is pointed up or down at this stage of each coach's career on a scale of one to 10. And this is often the tiebreaker between deciding where coaches get ranked, which I'll explain in a minute. Big game bonus is one to three points. Coaches known for producing in big games, the head coach at the Power 5 level are given a bonus of anywhere of one to three points. And then there's the Hall of Fame bonus, meaning coaches that are obviously destined for the College Football Hall of Fame for college coaching only based on their accomplishments up until this point, meaning the resume right now, if they never coached again, would they be in the College Football Hall of Fame? If that is true, then the answer is, uh, then you're given a bonus of three points. You can see here, I'm trying to come up with an a metric answer for every conceivable 
um, you know, uh, outlier, uh, the experienced coach that returns like a Mac Brown, uh, a brand new coach who excelled at other levels, but uh, has never been a power five coach. We, we, I tried to come up with something that would address everything uh, that kind of makes up uh, somebody's path to being a power five head coach. Um, a total of 31 points are possible. Ties were broken first by the highest score on the current coaching trajectory. Why that one? Because the number one reason I do this is to, turn, to help me find out which teams are going to be good this year. So who's got the most, the, the best coaching trajectory is why I chose that to be, or the best coaching trajectory is why I chose that to be first. And then if, if you're still tied after that, then I just settle it on my own. Um, and remember the coaching ratings, they, they factor into how I project how each team will finish in the upcoming season. So with that stipulated, Aaron, let us begin. Here are my top 10 coaches in my power ratings. Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney have been 1-2 in this exercise every year that I've done it. Brian Kelly moves up to number three. Kirby Smart at four. Jim Harbaugh is the first Michigan coach. Lincoln Riley, Kyle Whittingham of Utah, Jimbo Fisher, who has tumbled out of the top five, Mac Brown and Ryan Day. Those are my top 10. You have any quick thoughts on those? Not too many surprises there. I mean, Nick Saban, obviously, number one. I was a little surprised Kirby Smart uh, was, I mean, these are all 1A, 1B, 1C, but it was kind of funny to see Kirby Smart. I mean, he's the hottest coach in, in football right now, but uh, him down at number four. But again, only two points separate number five from number one, so not really that big of a squabble. Yeah, he, he, has, he hasn't been a head coach long enough to qualify for the Hall of Fame. That's basically so, the only thing. That's it. So Nick Saban has the three-point bonus, and Kirby Smart doesn't. Otherwise, if, if, I, think, I think Kirby is one or two years away from eligibility. And then once, if, so if he were there now, he would actually be number one on the list because he'd have those three points. Or maybe it's tied with Nick Saban. All right, the next uh, tier of rankings of college coaches we will take a look at. Um, the next 10, James Franklin at Penn State and Kirk, Kirk Ferentz at Iowa from the Big Ten. So several Big Ten coaches, four in the top 12. Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State, Dave Aranda at Baylor, Matt Campbell at Iowa State, Chris Kleiman at Kansas State, one of our big movers this year, Chip Kelly, Sonny Dykes at TCU, one of our big movers this year. The italics are for coaches in their first year at their respective school. There's Jeff Brom from Louisville, uh, Louisville, sorry, and Gus Malzahn from Central Florida rounds out the top 20 because, yes, Central Florida is now a Power 5 school, courtesy of the Big 12, Aaron. Does Baylor just keep, <clears throat> excuse me, lucking out with uh, pretty, pretty decent above-average coaches, or is that just a school that's really good at football uh, perennially, at least you know, in my adult lifetime, because... You know, Dave Aranda kind of came out of, well, I don't want to say came out of nowhere, but, um, you know, after oh, the Nebraska, Nebraska coach now, he kind of resurrected after uh, Art Bryles and then kind of striking gold again, uh, seemingly with Dave Aranda. That's a big surprise uh, to me. Um, and then you mentioned Chris Kleiman as well. He's done a great job at Kansas State. You always wonder, the guys who come from the power FCS schools, will that really translate at the next level? And so far for him, it has. Well, Baylor was a program that had one of the longest bolus streaks in college football from the mid-90s to the yeah. early 2000s. But then they brought in Art Bryles, invested heavily uh, in their facilities, and you're right now. And that's going to be most of your lifetime, right? That would be the yep. mid-2000s, so when you're about 9, 10 years old and starting to pay attention to college football really heavily for the first time. And since they made that massive investment, they absolutely have been a perennial power for sure. Uh, we continue. Uh, Brett Bielema at Illinois, P.J. Fleck at Minnesota. So there's the Big Ten again. Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss. Dave Dorn at NC State. Mark Stoops, Kentucky. Pat Narduzzi, Pittsburgh. Dave Clawson, Wake, Wake Forest. Pat Fitzgerald has taken a tumble in these ratings, down to number 28. Kalen DeBoer at Washington has climbed mightily in these ratings. And then Luke Fickle debuts at number 30 as the head coach now at Wisconsin and the only reason he's not higher, I mean, you can see the rest of his resume is very good when you look at how these are laid out. He just doesn't have a, much of a power five head coaching resume because he's been one for all of a handful of games as an interim coach at Ohio State. Yep, nothing super uh, surprising here. I mean, Pat Narduzzi might have been uh, a little bit uh, higher a few years ago, but he's done okay at Pittsburgh. It's just he's got to have some sort of breakthrough, uh, like big time breakthrough season in the ACC, I think. Uh, to climb into the next uh, echelon. Uh, Brett Bielema and P.J. Fleck. I think those being right next to each other, and Brett Bielema, as far as these ratings go, actually surpassing P.J. Fleck, 
uh, that's that's going to maybe be a tale of of this season as Illinois and Minnesota, you know, not necessarily the favorites in the uh, Big Ten West right now, but uh, that the, that game, that matchup actually could uh, go a long way in determining the the, the winner of of the Big Ten West, and I think that's maybe a little bit of foreshadowing because I think those teams really are and their trajectory really are very close. We continue with our college football head coach power ratings. Josh Heupel at Tennessee. Hugh Freeze debuts at Auburn at number 32. Matt Rule from the Big Ten debuting with Nebraska at number 33. Mario Cristobal at Miami. He's taking a tumble. Kalani Sataki, BYU. That's now a power five school, courtesy of the Big Ten. Sam Pittman at Arkansas. Mike Norvell at Florida State. Dana Holgerson, Houston. He's back in the power five and back in the Big 12. Uh, with Houston previously was at West Virginia Lance Leipold at Kansas has taken a monster leap in these ratings and then Steve Sarkeesian at Texas yeah speaking of Kansas man I saw this graphic the other day and I know we've talked about this in passing a few times I just cannot believe Kansas what was it 2008 went like 12 and one and went to the orange went to the orange bowl and won the orange Mm -hmm. bowl that just seems incredible to me and I you know I wish the best for them uh, Hugh Freeze at Auburn, I really think is going to turn that program around. I do too. He's had some yep. uh, rehab at uh, Liberty and did a pretty good job there. Matt Rule at Nebraska again. Don't know what to make. I, I think, I think they did the best they could, as we've discussed before. We'll just see if if that can be turned around. Uh, there, are no other huge takeaways uh, from from this uh, this echelon of of coaches. Hugh Freeze would still be the coach at Ole Miss if yep. not for the scandal. Yep. I mean, he beat Nick Saban two years in a row. He wasn't he wasn't let go for for the the performance. So I I agree. I think he will do a very good job at Auburn. Mel Tucker at Michigan State. Boy, you want to talk about guys who seem like they plateaued. It, and it's not on purpose that it just seems like the Big Ten has a coach at the top of the next year. Every time we do this, it just worked itself out that way. Greg Schiano next at forty two for Rutgers. Uh, Mike Elko at Duke took a major jump after an impressive nine-win debut as head coach of the Blue Devils. Dan Lanning at Oregon, Jonathan Smith at Oregon State. Scott Satterfield is now the coach at Cincinnati. He left Louisville to go to Cincinnati, now in the Big 12. Brett Venables at Oklahoma, no way to describe it as anything other than a disappointment. His first year there in uh, Norman. Marcus Freeman had a meh first year at Notre Dame. Uh, Joey McGuire had a good first year at Texas Tech. Shane Beamer, good first year at South Carolina. Both of them are big risers in these rankings. Yeah, if you would have told Oklahoma fans maybe two, three years ago, your next coach is going to be Brent Venables, and he's barely going to make it into the upper half, (laughs) upper half of uh, a coaching power rating, they would have told you no way. But yeah, that was a disappointing year. It's Oklahoma, though. You have to think they have the resources and talent to at least not uh, not not do the way they did last season. Greg Schiano, Mel Tucker, the Big Ten coaches on this list. I think it's safe to say, you know, unless he pulls a rabbit out of his hat, Mel Tucker is is heading even lower on this list probably next season. Mm. And Greg Schiano, you know, I don't know what the ceiling is for Rutgers, but I think he's got the best chance of any coach out there who could kind of figure out what the answer to that question is. Let's continue on as we get close to the end here. We'll go through the the last 15 uh, together. Billy Napier at Florida, disappointing first year there. Mike Loxley at Maryland, another Big Ten team. Jake Dickert at Washington State. Eli Drinkwitz, Missouri. Dino Babers on the hot seat there at Syracuse, probably. Tom Allen, who has fallen a lot uh, over the last two years. Uh, He's 56th. Jed Fish at Arizona. Brett Brett Pry, former Penn State defensive coordinator, had really struggled his first year as head coach at Virginia Tech. Clark Lee at Vanderbilt. Jeff Halfley at Boston College. And let's go ahead and get to go to the the last panel as well. These are the the end of the rankings. Justin Wilcox at Cal. Neil Brown at West Virginia, another coach on the hot seat there. Deion Sanders at Colorado debuts 63rd. Kenny Dillingham at Arizona State, also a debut coach. Tony Elliott had a disastrous and then, of course, tragedy, tragically fill, tragedy filled first year at Virginia. Ryan Walters, the new coach at Purdue, they went completely the other way. They went from an offensive mastermind to a defensive one. Brent Key remains at Georgia Tech. He was the interim last year. He got the full time job this year. Troy Taylor takes over at Stanford, and then Zach Arnett taking over after the sudden death of Mike Leach last year. Your thoughts on the final? 15 coaches on this list. What storylines stand out to you? So if you're the Big Ten commissioner, or if the Big Ten commissioner comes to you, I guess is a better way of saying, hey, hey, your uh, your coaching ratings 
are the are the rubric for what we want to see in our conference. What is the absolute worst? What's the bottom expectation in terms of where a Big Ten coach should be ranked on this list? I mean, you don't want to be anywhere below 50 for sure. And you'll notice that there's a there's a correlation between the coach and the job he's at, right? Like you can't be a top 15 coach on this list and be coaching at Indiana. You can't. So for Tom Allen to be like 31, just to throw out an arbitrary number, yeah. for Tom Allen to be 31 at Indiana would be like being top 10 at you know a, a higher level. For Tom Allen to be 31 at Indiana, that's Ryan Day being 10th at Ohio State. See where I'm going? Yep. So some schools come with them limitations. And like Dave Clawson, if I was hiring a new coach and Dave Clawson were a little bit younger, he would be higher on my list than where he is on this metric. But the problem is he's the coach at Wake Forest and that has limitations to it, right? Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, one more other quick note as well. So I mentioned Brett Venables at, at, uh, at Oklahoma. Yeah, terrible ranking for an Oklahoma coach. Yeah, terrible ranking for an Oklahoma coach. And I mentioned him being just inside the upper, you know, I'm talking about the entirety of, of college football, uh, FBS college football. Uh, group of five coaches, would any of them off the top of your head rank in your top coaches on this list? From the group of five, I would say, um, I don't know where they would rank because I'd have to go through yeah, the exercise, yeah, but what I'd rather question. have, um, uh, what's the, the army coach? Yeah. I'd rather have him over several power five coaches as an example. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, but you have some guys that I think are just are better at the power at the group of five level. I think Brady Hoke has proved that um, he's been outstanding in two runs at San Diego State. Not so much at Michigan. But Luke uh, Fickle would have been on this list. Luke Fickle year. would have been a coach like the one you're kind of talking about there. Um, I, th I wonder about Jamie Chadwell. I'd certainly have him higher. He's now at Liberty. I think a lot of people thought he was going to get a Power 5 job. He left instead for Liberty. He's a guy that I'd hire over several Power 5 uh, coaches on this list. So, yeah, there's a few p group of five coaches I would definitely hire over some of the Power 5 coaches on this list. Um, but if they have never... You know, like Jeff Tedford, I think you got a pretty good idea that he would, I mean, he once had Cal number two in the country. So I, I think that, you know, that he, you wouldn't have to project that Jeff Tedford could coach at a high level at the power five level. Some of the other names we've talked about, we're kind of projecting a little bit, if that makes sense. Yep. All right. Some final notes on these coaching power ratings that I, I want to point out as well. When you look at uh, the guys who have been the biggest risers and the biggest fallers on the list. But let's start with the average conference coach rank, all right? So this is the average ranking for a coach in your conference. The Big 12 was number one at 29.1. The Big 10 at 30.6. The SEC at 31.9. Those are all basically the same. The ACC a bit of a step down at 33.6. And Aaron, look at the Pac-12. Yeah, yikes. Yikes, yeah. 42.8. And then this year, the five biggest risers in our coaching uh, power ratings. Sonny Dykes, after TCU's amazing season, went up 19 spots. Mike Elko, after his amazing first year at Duke, up 17. Lance Leipold, literally resurrecting Kansas, up 16. Joey McGuire uh, beat uh, Clemson uh, and Tennessee in the same year at South Carolina, went up 15. Kalen DeBoer, after his outstanding debut at Washington, up 14. And then here are our biggest fallers. And you'll notice there's a bit of a trend line here of what league these guys are in. Tom Allen was the biggest faller, down 23 spots. Neil Brown at West Virginia, down 21 spots. Mario Cristobal had a disastrous uh, rookie season at Miami, down 16 spots. Mel Tucker, minus 13. Pat Fitzgerald, minus 12. In other words, three of the biggest fallers in our rankings from our own league, Aaron. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. And you look at Mario Cristobal. I mean, he was the hottest of mm -hmm. new hotnesses. And that was kind of a face plant. I mean, hopefully he can do something, but... Uh, where did he come from before? Was it Oregon? Oregon, yeah. yeah. And he was, I mean, you know, every right to believe that, you know, he could, uh, he had some coaching chops, but he's going to have to turn that around really quickly. But yeah, you don't want to see f three of the five biggest fallers from your own league. Now, it's not like Indiana, Michigan State, and Northwestern are like powerhouses in our league anyway, but you still don't want that baseline to be uh, anywhere where that is right now. All right, let's move on to topic number two. We have a new commissioner in the Big Ten, Aaron. Tony Petiti takes over for Kevin Warren. If you look at his bio, he has worked for all three uh, major television networks. Uh, he's a, So he's a former television, television executive. He's a former Major League Baseball executive as well. You can clearly see where this is going. Um, 
just as the Pac-12 hired somebody that was involved heavily in marketing and branding coming out of uh, Vegas, the Big Ten just said, let's just, you know, let's all be consenting adults here and just be honest with each other. Yep, this is a game the, of dialing for television yep. dollars, so let's go hire a damn TV executive to go dial for dollars for us. And that's what they did with Tony Petiti. Yeah, that's the big takeaway here is, I mean, the Big 12 kind of started this trend, though, with Brett Yormark. I mean, he came from, I think, wrestling too. or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And so these are this, the big takeaway here is, with the exception of the ACC, and I can't even think of the ACC's commissioner. Oh, it's Jim Phillips, the Jim old Northwestern AD. Yeah. Who so, got passed over for Big Ten commissioner by Kevin Warren. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, with that being the exception, the Power Five leagues as they exist right now, the sports have just basically said, yeah, we know what this is. This isn't really about student athletes and academic a- excellence at all. And I, I group Greg Sankey into this as well because I think he's just old school and he just wants to beat everybody. He just wants to win. And he'll do, I think he's shown, he'll do whatever it takes to put the SEC in a position to win. We'll talk about that more in, a, in just a, a few moments. Mm-hmm. But I, I think this the biggest story here is not necessarily, oh, they went off the board. No, this is not off the board anymore. This is the norm, and it will continue to be the norm. I mean, this guy, Tony Petiti, has, I believe, some experience with like Activision Blizzard as well, the video yeah. game makers. Yeah. And so that just tells you this guy is, um, this guy is well-versed, at the very least, in all forms of entertainment. Not necessarily, hey, how do we make the best educational experience for our student-athletes? So this is a tacit admission from four of the five power conferences that, yeah, this is all about TV bucks and this is all entertainment, which we all knew. We've all known for decades now that that's kind of what it is. It's been abundantly more obvious in the past few years, especially. Petiti also did an interview recently with Rich Eisen. He hasn't done a lot. I mean, we have not heard much from him since he took this job about a month ago. Uh, But he did do an interview recently with Rich Eisen and indicated that uh, the 2024 schedule and uh, conference layout will it be divisional it won't be but they haven't made it uh, you know they haven't made it for- official yet but uh, the format and the schedule for the Big 10 in 2024 with the additions of USC and UCLA those are imminent like literally any day now but uh, other than that he's been really quiet hasn't made a lot of news i think we knew when kevin warren took over that the next tv deal and how to navigate that with the changing landscape of the technology after you know I mean, Jim Delaney was the maestro at that stuff and helped build the Big Ten into the powerhouse that it is now. That we, I think we all knew that was going to be Kevin Warren's number one priority. And he didn't get a lot right while he was here, but that's one thing where he did stick the freaking landing was the most important thing, the TV deal. Now, there will be another TV deal, what, here in about four or five years. Uh, and if Tony Petiti lasts that long, he'll negotiate that one. But that's not a number one pressing issue. That's a few years off. What would you say is his number one pressing issue right now for the conference? I would say if I were in his shoes right now, I would feel the most pressure about making sure that these games actually deliver for the networks as they can. Now, that, now the TV deal was not his thing. He doesn't have his uh, fingerprints all over it. But whatever it takes to make sure the most compelling matchups are in prime time every week – I would I would do that because that's going to go a lot into figuring into whatever the next deal is, which mm-hmm. you might have to negotiate. So that's always football games and making sure that your league is put in a position, you're putting yourselves in a position where you get the best talent, which again is kind of an individual school league, but promoting that from the commissioner's offense, uh, office, making sure you have the most talent so you're not just, when you're putting these games out in prime time now, they're actually delivering for your television prop partners. That would be the thing that I'm that I would feel the most pressure on. And so that hits on NIL quite a bit. Making sure you don't have a a case like Iowa did with their outgoing athletic director and Gary Barda. He never ever called Brad Heinrichs, who is the who is the lead of the 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 Swarm Collective. Never ever even called him. Wouldn't pick up the phone. Because apparently the the word on the street is that uh, they were concerned about poaching other donors, other boosters to the athletic department. No, that type of situation doesn't happen in our league. We're putting ourselves in the best p- uh, position. We're not too good to do NIL. We're not going to fight with one arm beh- tied behind our back. We're going to put this league in the best position it absolutely can, and that starts with luring as many of the as as much of the top talent to this league is. as possible. See, I think that's it. I think this is where you got to get creative. Uh, you have demographic issues. And 
but let's just be honest. This is about football primarily, and it, therefore it's primarily about the Big Ten and the SEC. I want to say that the Big Ten and the SEC combined for like 75 uh, NFL draft picks in the last draft, and the rest of the leagues combined didn't combine. The power leagues combined didn't combine for that. Some crazy number like that. So this is about the procuring of talent to compete with the SEC. And you simply can't compete with the demographic advantage the SEC has. But what advantage do you have? As they once said in the movie Blue Chips, cash. Cold, hard cash. And your universities have, mass, have massive endowments and budgets that dwarf what uh, Bubba the Booster in the SEC has. Uh, this is where I'd be talking to my partners the TV, at TV networks. I want, I want to defer $2 million dollars from each school. So instead of 100 million now or 90, whatever the number is, you're getting 98 or 88. Two million dollars for each school. That is player NIL money directly funded by television networks. And in exchange, on request, players will do promotions for the networks, the games, branding, appearances, etc. Uh, but each each team in the Big Ten on a perennial basis has a two million dollar salary pool for NIL divided by 85 or how many players you want to pay. You want to pay your walk-ons too because you're a school like Michigan that has decided scholarship limits don't matter to you because you can just pay walk-ons via NIL and put good players without scholarships. Whatever you want to do, you div- you've got $2 million. You can divide that by however many players you want, but every school has that, um, and that is a deferment from the television networks as part of the TV deal for the a- acquisition of talent. That kind of stuff, I think, is what Tony Batiti needs to be talking about. Indeed. All right, let's talk some hoops. It's early yet, but we kind of are starting to get a picture of what the rosters look like, except at Michigan. We'll talk about that in a second. But for everybody else, the deadline for the NBA draft was May 31. Now, Juwan Howard's trying to build a roster here at the last minute on the fly. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But remember 2018, the NSA tournament, Aaron? Yep. And Virginia became the first number one seed ever to lose to a 16, Maryland, Baltimore County. Remember this? Mm-hmm. And everybody came back, and they were a national laughing stock, perennial NCAA tournament loser. They could never get out of the first weekend, et cetera. And then what happened the next year? They won it all. They won it all. Zach Eady is back for the Boilermakers. That means that whole team is back. They, they could be the preseason number one team. They're certainly going to be in the conversation. Could they be the, could, could Purdue 23 24 be Virginia 18 19? Thoughts? I don't know, man. It's uh, just such a weird, just such a weird team. It really is. Now, Zach Eady, I thought he really took his game to the next level. So he's going to be the difference on that team no matter who they surround him with. Now, the question is whether who they surround him with can actually elevate, uh, you know, elevate his game or elevate the entire team. But in the Big Ten specifically, Indiana, Northwestern, Michigan State. I mean, Maryland, Michigan, no. Iowa, no. I don't really see anybody competing with them necessarily in the Big Ten. I think Michigan gonna, State's going to be really good. Yeah. Okay. So I don't really see – Maybe okay, throw Michigan State in there. Who else yeah. could really give them uh, fits, you know, once a week, once every other week or something like that? I don't really see anybody. So in the Big Ten, they should be set – I, I don't know. Matt Painter's – the big games, I've just – when you lose to a 16 seed, I'm just going to fade you no matter what. Now, maybe they'll use that as motivation. They better use that as motivation. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to make that proclamation or comparison quite yet to Virginia. So, so I think – so we all know Purdue has not made a Final Four since 1980, which is still incredible to me, despite all their success. Well, despite all of Virginia's success – I don't think the Cavaliers had made a Final Four since 84 was their last Final Four. Hmm. So the, the time periods are very similar. The circumstances are seri- similar. The style of play of both teams, similar. I don't know. Just you could see some symmetry there for sure. Let, let's talk about what's going on at Michigan right now. Now, it turns out the day we're recording this, Juwan Howard got some huge news. But it's been a crazy offseason for them. They did just land one of the best players in the transfer portal this year. Um, Olivier and Quanu, I believe is his name, the transfer from Tennessee, who was in the NBA draft until the last minute. He was rumored to be, at, to be a Michigan lean and then suddenly dropped him the other day and then suddenly committed to them today. I mean, that's just kind of emblematic of what this offseason has been like for Juwan Howard. He had the number one recruiting class in the country two years ago, Aaron. That class, except for the lowest-ranked player, has completely washed out in less than two calendar years. 
And now you, they lost their top three scorers, Kobe Bufkin, Jed Howard off to the NBA, Hunter Dickinson off to chase NIL money at Kansas because he's probably not an NBA player. And he is starting over after a disappointing year. Before the the addition of the of the transfer today, I probably would have rated Michigan. That's right, Michigan, the 12th or 13th best roster in our league. I'd probably rate them somewhere like 9th or 10th right now. And if they can land another transfer, maybe they're back into fringe NCAA tournament territory. But given the way that he started and the hype he had coming in, this is not where Michigan fans thought they were going to be heading in to his fourth or his fifth season as head coach. Yeah. Um, do you know this guy uh, from Tennessee, this transfer? Do, do you, I mean, is, Olivier he going to, and yeah, is he going to be able to pass the, uh, the, the academic standards? Yes, he's Michigan? graduated. He, he has a degree. Graduated. Yeah, that's the other thing. Juwan With has Caleb this penchant Love. for recruiting yeah. guys that he, can't, that, that he doesn't know you can get into school. And, and I don't want to – dude, don't you think you should know that ahead of time? Maybe. Maybe. Can, can you qualify to get into my school? And don't tell me Michigan – Michigan won 13 Big Ten championships this last academic year. There's one program at Michigan having this issue. It's Juwan's. Yeah. And so I don't – you're the leader of the team – Really going back to towards the end of not this last season, but the season before that, losing your temper, smacking a Wisconsin assistant coach, something is just not right there. If you're shaky at the top, shaky is probably the best description from the outside looking in that I can give Michigan basketball right now. If you're mm-hmm. shaky at the top, you're going to be shaky. I don't really care how many five-star recruits you landed because you had some good record- recruiting classes there. And like you said, they're all gone. So. Yeah. I still consider this, even with this addition today, I could still consider this a, a free fall. Final thing, let's go back to football. The SEC announcing, despite going to 16 teams as well, with Oklahoma and Texas next year, that for now, it's going to stay at eight conference games with 16 teams. Now, it is trying to offset this and the, the back, uh, you know, the, the, the reverb against this by saying that it's also going to demand that every SEC team play at least one Power 5 conf- non-conference game as kind of your ninth conference game. There's a lot of thought that this is a one-year thing because a lot of the ADs in the league were concerned about how many non-conference games they would have to buy out in one year, in one academic year, uh, by, by you know taking those off the board. Where if you, if you wait a year... And then there's fewer games. Wait two years, and there's fewer games. So I, I, I think this is likely temporary. And if it is temporary, then you just do what you're going to do as the Big Ten and move on. But if it's not temporary, I, I think Tony Petiti has to act here. I, I think that there, he needs to make some demands of a strength of schedule component within the playoff um, at-large selection process because that's a huge advantage for the I don't for the SEC to get a chance to continue to schedule down and play one less conference game while everybody else is playing nine. But what are your thoughts? I agree with that. So we talked to her, I talked a little bit ago about, you know, how are you going to lure top talent? Well, the SEC has been doing that under the table, and but over the table as well, just on the playing field where you come to the SEC, you go to the right program, you're going to be playing amongst the best. So if you're going to go risk life and limb, risk your future playing career, you might as well be doing doing it in a conference where you have the best chance at making it to the biggest stage. You know, that's that's the brand that they're selling, and you can't really argue with the results on the field for the most part. But they do that and they help and you know, they help accomplish that by scheduling cupcakes in November. Mm-hmm. Now if they let's let's just say they schedule a Big Ten Big 12 team in their non-conference. Let's let's even say they play that in November. They're still so good, they might knock the doors. They might blow the doors off those teams. Mm-hmm. But they're still at an advantage because they're not required, or not requiring their schools uh, to play nine conference games, and they're not, uh, you know, the requirements for their non-con are pretty, uh, pretty lax as well. So if I'm Big Ten Commissioner Petiti, as you said, if they stay with this, that's, they're well within their rights but I would either be making some changes to my, which you really can't do because of the TV deal, but you would you would need to make some demands of the college football playoff. Uh, yeah. I absolutely believe with uh, agree with that. You can't just let them essentially play 11 games and have it matter as much as right. you guys playing 12 games total and uh, nine in the conference. Well, speaking of TV deals, I mean, ESPN's okay that 
um, Texas and Texas A&M are going to play every year? Because there's this the with the eight, it, there's one guaranteed rival for Texas. It'll be Oklahoma. So we're not going to have Texas and Texas A&M play. For Auburn, it'll be Alabama. Okay, we're not going to have the South's oldest rivalry. Auburn and Georgia aren't going to play. Alabama's not going to play LSU every year. Of course, ESPN's not going to be satisfied with that. I, that's why I think this is just a temporary thing for one, two years tops to lessen the cost of, buy, of buying out a lot of non-conference games. And when Texas and Oklahoma, they're not yet voting members. There's that mid-tier of SEC program, the Kentucky of the Kentuckys and South Carolinas, they don't want to play nine games because they're trying to schedule a bowl game, and that makes it harder, right? But when Oklahoma and Texas get into the league, they're going to vote for nine games. Uh, and, and you know, look at this graphic from On3 Sports. Teams playing 10 or more Power 5 schools in 2023, all right? 11 out of 14 teams in the Big Ten are doing that this year. Only two of the 14 teams in the SEC are doing it. That's a freaking joke, man. That's that an, an absolute freaking joke. It's a bit of an advantage. It's a bit of an advantage. Just a tad. Yeah, that's a complete freaking joke. And in an era where half of the playoff field now is going to be picked by a committee, you've got to make sure there's some kind of strength of schedule component in there uh, in order to deflect against that. All right, we'll come back, play our weekly game of Would You Rather next. All right, Aaron, time to play Would You Rather for the first time this season. Here we go. You're up first. Would you rather be Juwan Howard or Mel Tucker right now? Both these coaches have a penchant for recruiting guys they can't get into school or sign. I would still rather be Juwan Howard just by virtue of the basketball schedule. There are more games to, uh, I guess, turn things around or dig your own grave. I guess you can look at it that way. With Mel Tucker, you know, you've only got basically 12 opportunities to turn things around. Things can go south very, very quickly. So just by the nature of the schedule itself, I'd stick with Juwan Howard. Okay. Would you rather watch Michigan versus East Carolina or on Peacock or Akron versus North Dogwood Tech on ESPN2? I would rather watch Michigan um, on uh, on a residential street. Yeah. Let alone Peacock. Indeed. This right. this this happened too with uh, with ESPN Plus and uh, yeah putting putting games on ESPN ESPN Plus which is where most Big Twelve games in their in their package are Correct. going to be. I by can't the way. believe I have to pay five dollars to get this game. Yeah, you're still going to pay it. Now the advantage though is that I think you're still going to be getting the same production value on Peacock that you would be getting on Big NBC. Yes. For these games, Let's hope that's so, the anyway. difference between I think Peacock and ESPN Plus. Let's hope so. All right, for you, would you rather the Big Ten target Notre Dame and Miami, who just got added to the Association of American Universities? Why does that matter? Remember, since the Big Ten began expansion with Penn State in 1991, the league has added no teams that were not members of the prestigious, academically prestigious Association of American Universities. Yes, I know Nebraska is not a member now, but it was when the Big Ten added it and then it got kicked out. Notre Dame and Miami, along with Florida State and South Florida, just got admitted to the AAU. Oregon and Washington are already in the AAU. So if you were the Big Ten, if you were Tony Petiti, Aaron, would you rather that he target Notre Dame and Miami or Oregon and Washington? So as a fan, this is easy. I'd rather target Notre Dame and Miami. Now, if I were commissioner myself... I, I don't think those two are gettable right now, so I would target Oregon and Washington. I just feel like you're wasting your time if you're targeting Notre Dame and Miami. Not that, uh, you know, if that pulled through, that would not be a waste of time. I just don't think they're, they're gettable at the moment. Now, Brett McMurphy today, he reported that uh, his sources are saying the Big Ten is totally fine with dropping kind of the unspoken rule of an AAU requirement to get into the Big Ten. So that opens the door for you know some some other options as well. But as a fan, obviously, go for Notre Dame and Miami. I wonder if that is a wink and a nod at Clemson. Huh. With the the ACC will not last. Um, it, it, it's going to last for a few more years because that grant and rights can't be broken. But the closer we get to twenty thirty six, Aaron, the less expensive it gets. So when the next Big Ten TV deal, I think, is starts in twenty thirty. Yep. I could see. I think that's when it is. I could see that's. You know, you don't want to pay a hundred million a team. Would you pay fifty million? So, so that's a that's a lot more affordable. Yep. Okay, and especially if you're adding Clemson, Florida State. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something to think of. I misspoke earlier, by the way. Florida State did not get admitted to the AAU, so it's actually maybe a reference to them. Um, South Florida got admitted to the AAU, but Florida State did not yet. 
Final one is for you. Would you rather be North Carolina or Washington during the next round of expansion realignment? I'd absolutely rather be North Carolina, without question. Um, I'm in the Eastern time zone, and I, I know, I know I've got three options. I know the Big Ten would want me as a prestigious AAU public university. I know the, AC, the SEC would love to have me to expand its footprint into my region. And I know that I've got a strong enough footprint in this region. I could just go off and start my own league with whatever teams are left over, and it would be at least somewhat viable. Washington only has two of those options. Um, and so I would much rather be North Carolina. I've got three options. I've got three outs, North Carolina or Washington, I think only has two and we're not sure, maybe, you know, there, a lot of us, myself included, thought all along that USC and UCLA would not want to be the only West Coast teams in the Big Ten. But when you take up, when you take travel off the table and look at it from marketing and branding, it's, it's every other advantage to be the only West Coast mm -hmm. teams in the Big Ten. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Travel is a motherless goat. And especially when you get into the Olympic sports and how many nights a week they're going to play and everything else, that's much more difficult and expensive. I agree. But that's if. But when you take travel off the table, it, every other metric would tell UCLA and USC to be the only two West Coast teams in the Big Ten. So, something else to keep in mind. We'll come back and wrap things up here in just a moment. All right, our very first Twitter poll of the new season. We asked you which Big Ten football coach is under the most pressure in 2023. Brian Ferentz, OC at Iowa, who literally is under a scoring margin. You know how many podcasts are going to be counting down Iowa to 300 points? All of them. All of them this season. He has a super majority of the responses here at 67.4%. Ryan Day is next at 14.1%. Tom Allen. And it looks like you voted for Pat Fitzgerald yeah. as uh, the hottest uh, seat in the league. You never specify. Well, I think the obvious. <laughs> it's not Brian Fer Ferentz. If, do you think if he scores, what it, oh, I think it's 23 points or something like that, or 24 points a game, do you think if they average 23 and a half, he's not going to be back next year? I don't know. Are they 10 and 2, 9 and 3? Then yeah. he's back. Are they 7 and 5? Yeah. Maybe not. So I, I'm just skeptical that any anybody with Ferentz DNA is under any sort of pressure ever. Can't blame Even with the new AD? Can't blame you for yeah. that. Yeah. So um, I, I voted for Pat Fitzgerald. You never specified whether this was external or internal pressure. Now, I good don't point. know the guy. That's a good point. I don't know the guy, but he seems built like the type of dude that's like, Times they are a change, and yes, they're going to build a new stadium here that's going to be super cool. How long do I really? I'm, I, I built this program into something that's respectable, but times are changing, and I don't want to be stuck spinning my wheels here. So how much pressure is he putting himself under to just, you know what, let's make something respectful here so I can... Now, this is his alma mater. I don't know if he'd jump ship from his alma mater. Again, I don't know the guy, but he just... I don't think he's the type of dude. He doesn't strike me as the type of dude that wants to necessarily waste his years on something that just may not be possible to be successful in this era when you take into account the restrictions or the restraints that Northwestern is under just because of the, the academic standards they have there. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. All right, feedback of the week. Isaiah Walker says, I would have said Ryan Day. Prior to Gary Barter retiring, we'll see if a new AD actually has the guts to stand up to the Ferences. By the way, Kirk Ferentz is number 12 in my college football coaching power ratings and would absolutely be a Hall of Famer if his career ended today. That doesn't mean he's beyond reproach and criticism, okay? But this idea that he has somehow held Iowa hostage is going too far too, don't you think? He's been a tad, he's been a wee bit successful at Iowa, okay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think you can be frustrated on a micro level with some of the stubbornness. On the other hand, on a macro level, he's put together a Hall of Fame resume at Iowa. Yeah, I think you can. I think you can. I think both things, both impulses can be sure. true at the same time. Especially if you're looking at the end of his reign and you don't want him to try to put too much pressure yeah. on what happens after him. Like what yeah. Bill Snyder did at Kansas State. And they didn't listen to him, by the way. And he wanted his son well Sean to be the coach. Yeah. They didn't listen. They hired Chris Kleiman and, well... They just won the Big 12 Conference, so there you go. All right, good stuff, man. A jam-packed opening episode in two weeks when Bigger 10 returns because next week it's Michigan Podcast. We're going to alternate the two here until we get to Big 10 Media Days. In two weeks, Aaron, it's one of our favorite episodes every year. Yep. We're going to go through the anonymous coach quotes by Athlon Sports and React. That's always a ton of fun. So that is two weeks from now. Hope you enjoyed 
this episode of Bigger Ten. Good to be back for another year. The season will get here before you know it. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Bigger Ten. Like, rate, subscribe, share, five-star review, whichever applies, however you watch or listen. Thanks to all of you that do all those things and help us to find more Big Ten fans just like you. Until the next time, for Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. We'll see you then. 